my name is Otane Rewiti, and I work for Auckland Council. My job tonight is to open open our, uh, our time up here in another Auckland conversation. So um, my karakia that I will use tonight is, is the council standard, actually, Whakatakati um, Hau. And it talks about the winds uh, and the cold, the winds that blow onto the land, the winds that blow offshore, and the winds that bring the cold, the snow, the frost. Uh, but every day, as the sun breaks through the dawn, it gives us a glimpse of perhaps a glorious day. To me, that talks about the, the voting as well, because uh, is it going to be a wind of change? Is it going to be uh, the normal wind that blows blows into Tamaki Makoto? Uh, whatever the wind that blows, uh, perhaps let our let our blessing be that it's it brings a glimpse of something glorious for Tamaki Makoto. So let us give thanks uh, uh, this evening for that. Your part of this, as you know, to those who usually attend the conversation, when you hear the words, tuturu o fiti whakamaua kia tina, your response is tina. So we're going to have a practice, because people like to have a practice. Okay, so here we go. Tuturu o fiti whakamaua kia tina. tina. Okay, tina sounds really tired this <laughs> evening. Uh, so... So we want it, Tina, because it's, we're looking forward to something tonight. So, looking forward to the conversation that's going to happen. Tuturu o fiti whakamaua kia Tina. Tina. That's much better. Tina's wide awake. Um, your next response after the words, homi e hui e, your response is taiki e. So, we'll practice that. Homi e hui e. Okay, let's get started this evening. Let's give thanks. Kei noi tātou. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai. E hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hau hu. Tuturu o fiti whakamaua ki a tina. Haumi e hui e tai ki e. Nō rere e ngā mana e ngā reo, a rauranga tirama. Tēnei te mihi ki a koutou, nau mā haramai, ki tēnei whare. Te whare kōrero uh, mō tāmaki i roto tēnei rangi, i roto tēnei uh, pō. Nō reira, nau mā hara mai, marea mai tō tāringa e whakarongo ki ngā kōrero o ngā kai kōrero e noho nei i te pōnei. Nō reira, ka mea e a mātou nei tōku nei, a mā, a mātua tūpuna, he aha te hau e wawara, e wawara. He tiu he raki, he tiu he raki. Nāna ia mai te pūpū taraki hi kiuta, e tiki nga atu he hau te kōtū. Ko ia te pau, te pau whakairo, ka tū ki te wai te mata, i oku wairangi e. Uh, ko te pātai ki au, nei ki a koutou, he aha te hau e wawara. Uh, he mea hau, he mea tāwhitso, nō reira, kai a koe tērā i roto, Nā pōtitanga, uh, kua tai mai, kei wainganui a tata. Nā, nō reira, he whakatau ki, ki, te, ki te mutunga o toku nei kōrero. Mā pango, mā whero, ka oti ki te mahi. Nō reira, i ngā mana, i ngā reo, rauranga tirama, ka huri taku reo. Greetings this evening, and as we come to another Auckland conversation, I am reminded, I welcome you here first of all, to this place, to this uh, theatre where we can talk together, pose questions to the panel and uh, generally get some idea of, of what wind might be changing. My people of Ngāti Whātua have a saying, what is this wind that blows from the northeast, that blows Tonga up onto the, to the sands? We've placed our marker in the Waitamata let people know who we are. But I want to just go back to the beginning of that corridor. What is this wind of change that blows? So for the election 
coming. Um, I'm also reminded of a song uh, that talks about the wind as well. And uh, that song goes, The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. So, te ho, ewawara, ewawara. What is this wind of change? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. I finished with a proverb. Ma pango, ma fero ka oti te mahi. With the red and the black, the job will be finished. It referred to the colours, traditional colours that Māori use. But in the sense that I want to use it, it actually refers to the different ethnicities, the different people, the different um, people or groups that will combine together to um, to search for those goals or try to attain the goals for all of us. Noreda. Ngā mana, i ngā reo, rauranga tira mā hurino tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā tātou katoa. Nō reira ka hoatū, ki a koe, Oscar, mau te, te kōrero nāne, nō reira mā rō, ka wāti onga. O tēnē reweti, ladies and gentlemen. Tēnā koutou, tālo for lava, mā lō le lei, ni Stambula, Kiorana, blah, blah, blah. Uh, a fifth of the world's languages are spoken in the Pacific, so I have to do them real quickly. We'd use up our remaining hour and 21 minutes. <laughs> uh, I'm Oscar Kiteley, and I will be facilitating the conversation this evening. Auckland Conversation provides an opportunity to inspire and stimulate your thinking about the challenges facing Auckland. Tonight, we welcome a panel of experts to discuss the question, voting, why bother? Mm. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. This is a fantastic turnout. That's in the script. Um, and welcome those who are joining us online who are watching on the Auckland Conversations website. Our thanks to our Auckland partner, South Base Construction, our design partner, Razine. Uh, was that Razine? Is that a Samoan company? Mm. And all our program supporters, firstly, a few housekeeping notes. In the unlikely event of an emergency, an alarm will sound. You'll know this noise. It's quite alarming sounding. Uh, and we'll be directed out of the building by our ushers. Those are the people that aren't allowed to sit down. Easily recognisable. Uh, exits are clearly marked with the word exit, which I think is Latin for way out. Is it? Oh, I made that up. Oh, wow. Is that right? Oh, shucks. Awesome. Uh, bathrooms are on the lower ground level of the building. Please use them. We want to get our bond back. Uh, does Auckland Council have to pay a bond? Anyway. Uh, down one flight of stairs from the theatre entrance and our accessible and gender neutral toilets are on level two. And finally, could you all please turn all mobiles to silent? Um, now, the, the format for tonight will be a discussion with our panellists, a conversation, and we will also open up that conversation to questions from the floor. We'll be using Slido, which is an interactive Q&A tool for audience questions. If you have a smartphone, which will be turned to silent, we encourage you to visit slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O dot C-O-M, enter the event code uh, hashtag election and ask your question, and they show up on this flash thing. It's got an iPad. Um, and we will get through as many as we can, and, and you can submit your question anytime during the conversation. Alternatively, feel free to raise your hand and go, hey, uh, during the interactive Q&A to ask a question. You're welcome to tweet during the event. I know you want to, using the hashtag um, AKL Conversations. And we always try to ensure that the Auckland Conversation events are inclusive and accessible, and on-demand viewing of the event an on-demand viewing of the event, a full transcript and captioning on the event and presentations will be available on the Auckland Conversations website in the next few days. Oh, shit. I better not swear. <laughs> I'm going to be checking that tonight. 
full turn section. Um, and now, let's set the scene. Okay, on to tonight's conversation. The decisions made around the council table impact us more directly than those made at central government level. So why do so few people vote in the local elections and what can be done to get more people involved in local politics? This September and October, New Zealanders go to the polls to choose the people who will represent them in local government for the next three years. While voter turnout at the last general election in 2017 was 79%, which I think is amazing, nationwide turnout at the last local election in 2016 was 43%. In Auckland, it was even lower. Shame. Auckland, shame. 38.5%, just that percentage of Aucklanders chose to vote. And yet, uh, local government affects nearly every aspect of our daily lives. Auckland's mayor, councillors and local board members make decisions on everything from, you know, rubbish collections, libraries, playgrounds, how many lights each neighbourhood gets, to the public transport system that moves us around the city and the amount we pay in rates. Um, and uh, let's get on with it, shall we? I am now pleased to bring our panellists onto the stage. Please help me in welcoming uh, Director of Action Station and Co-Founder and Chair of Rock and Roll, Laura O'Connell Rapida. <laughs> Senior Lecturer, Design Director, Design and Democracy Project, Massey University, Carl Kane. <laughs> Chief Executive, uh, Super Diversity Institute for Law at Chen Palmer, Marina Matthews. Senior Advisor, uh, External Relations, uh, AT Chair and Auckland District Licensing Agency and former Councillor of the Auckland Council, Michael Goody. <laughs> oh, Gowdy. Oh, sorry. Apologies, Michael Gowdy, ladies and gentlemen. And also, journalist currently editing uh, uh, the new local pop elections pop-up section of the spin-off and awesome website, Hayden Donnell. And um, before we kick into this conversation, um, I'd just like to get a show of hands with our audience and wonder, who here has voted in a local body election? Okay, thank you. How, how, what, hey? Uh, who hasn't? <laughs> shame, Oscar, shame. Wow, that's interesting. Um, and so I guess I want to ask, to kick us off, I'd like to ask each of you the same question, just to start this conversation. Why? Why do you think not many people vote? Laura, can we start with you? Or actually, anybody who wants to go ahead, but I, I, I want to ask that of each of you. Why don't we vote? <laughs> or why don't enough of us vote? Uh, good, everyone. Um, so I think the reason's really complex. Um, so for the last five years, I've been uh, working on a campaign called Rock and Roll, which um, my flatmates and I started because we were wanting to make uh, political engagement more interesting to people in our age group. And so we, um, I was a, a, an event organiser at the time. I was primarily interested in organising parties uh, that um, raised funds for environmental charities. And that's what I saw as my offering to doing something meaningful. And... Um, uh, and decided to translate that model into running parties. Um, we did this at the general election in 2014 all around the country where the only way a person could get a ticket is if they made a promise to vote. We weren't trying to get them to vote for a particular political party. We were just trying to get them started in the voting habit. And so making a promise meant filling in a form that basically gave us their name, their email, their phone number, and ticking a box that says, I promise to vote in the election. And then in the weeks leading up to the election, we'd give them a call to say, hey, have you actually voted? And... Um, in, in planning that, we dug into the research into why young people don't vote. And actually, if you look at the demographics of the people who are least likely to vote, uh, it's people who are Māori, it's people who are Pacifica, it's people who have recently migrated to New Zealand, it's people from low income or low education backgrounds, and it's people who live in rural areas. And if you look at the reasons for each of those groups, it's actually very complex. So for Māori, a lot of it has to do with an intergenerational distrust of the Crown and its agents due to our colonial history. Um, if you look at Pacifica, That's a biggie. yeah. <laughs> if you look at Pacifica uh, people, um, it was a lack of a sense of belonging because when you know a lot of the migration from the Pacific to New Zealand happened, we sort of just put them in one place um, and left them and um, and then raided them, uh, you know, early in the morning and have never apologised for that. And so, 
um, the reasons are really, really complex. And then when it comes to local government, I think one of the additional factors over the last 10, 15 years, which I think Hayden can speak more to as well, is that um, we no longer buy newspapers, which means that uh, there's no longer advertising revenue for newspapers, which means that newsrooms have shrunk and there are fewer and fewer journalists able to cover what's going on in local government. And uh, because of that, we're not hearing about what's happening and therefore it's more difficult to engage. And so that just gives a sense of how many complex factors there are involved and why people don't vote. The other thing, of course, that's happening globally is a swing towards populism um, and uh, the return of Nazis. Um, frankly, um, and that's terrifying. And so, um, you know, we live in a, in a society that has so far failed to um, deliver the types of changes for marginalised people and people are starting to lose faith in that and look to strong men, authoritarian alternatives to the status quo. And that's concerning. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> wow. <laughs> As you say, that's mad complex. Um, Carl. Yeah, kia ora, uh, te whare tēnei tēnā koe. Um, why don't people vote? Um, I'll go a bit more meta. Um, I think that if you look at the systems we have of governance in Aotearoa um, and look at where we got them from and when we got them from, if that's a, is that a thing, when we got them from, um, but um, the, the, the systems and structures we imported from 17th, 18th century England, you know, Westminster um, modes of uh, representative democracy. And then we look at uh, our Pacific context is in the 21st century, our digital, digitally connected, uh, deliberative, immediate, you know, th these very different lives. So we've got very old tools, old political tools, and we're asking um, this generation to engage with these very old tools. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure they can. I'm not sure that they are um, uh, able to look at the things they want to affect and the change they want to affect in the world and see that once every three years ticking a box is a way of achieving that. So I think we've got some issues with the structures and I think there are some ways that Rangatahi in particular can hack into those structures to make them more their own and more uh, useful to them. But um, currently I think, yeah, we've got the wrong tools for the job um, and we're approaching the tools we have in a really um, uh, clumsy way. So I think we can do better with what, with what we've got, but ultimately when people do turn up and vote, we can start to evolve those tools and make them a little bit more um, uh, suitable for a 21st century use. Thank you, Ka. Well, mihi maira, kia koutou katoa, aha koa he mihi iti, uh, he mihi mahana, uh, kia koutou. Um, I guess I would follow on um, from what Carl had said and say that I think the importance of voting starts in school and with uh, good civics education. And if you don't have your children or your tamariki or your rangatahi learning about the importance of voting, then they won't enrol and then they won't vote. I mean, I, I was just looking at the title before, uh, voting, why bother? It should go a step back, enrolling, why do it so that you can vote, why bother? Because you can't vote if you're not enrolled. And I, I think that uh, the importance of civics education is not only to learn about our history, Aotearoa's history, but also to learn about the importance of a democracy and having our part or letting the children know about their part in New Zealand and Aotearoa's democracy. Kia ora. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Gaudi. I might just read from Hayden's notes on this one. <laughs> um, yeah, what they said. No, honest. Um, I think actually largely you've picked up a lot, particularly I think that educational piece is huge. And I, and I, like, I'm from Rodney, fairly grew up Coromandel Provincial, and I think you, even just been on the fringes of the city, where it's probably more, uh, there's more awareness than that, we, I just didn't know about it. Like, I had no idea. I didn't know what it entailed, and I probably, if I hadn't, um, if one particular thing hadn't piqued my interest, I probably would remain with that unwashed mass and just let things go. Um, I think local government particularly has, um, it's not as sexy, it's got a bit of a bad rap, it's this big beast that sits in town and the wheels churn and it's that old, well, what, you know, what, how am I going to be able to influence it anyway? Um, and to the contrary, you know, like I think your ability to influence because no one really participates uh, is huge. So... I think it's a. I think it would. It's like heaps of things. I think in in New Zealand where there actually needs to be a, a bit of a culture change, and that isn't a quick fix over a couple of elections, and it it needs to start deep and it 
It is extremely complex on a whole lot of levels. So um, I think the one piece that I always go back to was I just I got through right through through well I dropped out and failed high school. But what school did you go to? Oriwa College. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not a good one. <laughs> the one that got all the expellees from all the other ones. Yeah. Um, so I think even when I got through to finally when a university would take me, um, I, I still didn't really know about what local government was or is or how it lived in my day to day. And so, um, yeah, I think an educational piece from, from really, and, and we see, you know, offshore they do it really well and probably they've got some other mechanisms, but that educational piece is key, I think. Yep. Thank you. Hayden? I just think everyone else really got all the good ones, especially Laura. I feel like you kind of hogged a few right up the up, up front. Yeah, I won't, I won't ask her first next yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. I think that probably local government in general is probably just seen as uh, really boring, particularly by young people. I mean, I was talking to a guy a day. He's like a, a, a young lawyer, so he's pretty highly engaged. And he's just like, oh, you're editing the Svinos local government section. He's, he's like a pitying tone, like a really <laughs> pitying tone, like, oh... How are you going to survive? And you, I was talking to you about being a counsellor, and you were bored as hell. So, I mean, there is a... <laughs> I mean, but my hot take is actually that local government is actually probably more exciting than central government. Like, like what's central government doing? It's like working out the structure of PHOs or something. You know, that's not interesting either. It's just that there's interesting people there. And a cycleway coming to your door is far more interesting than that or, or, the, or over the Harbour Bridge or a new park or something. That's actually going to make a difference to my life, but people don't give a hoot. Um, yeah, uh, and, and I guess that, that message isn't coming through. Maybe that does come back to what you say is this kind of staid... I, I, I don't know. I don't give the media too much credit. We're useless. But, I mean... I mean, we probably do have some kind of an influence. Like, there, there is a staid media environment. I think probably, I love him, he's a lovely guy, but Boone Rawlsman has kind of terrorised Auckland for, for multiple decades of <laughs> just this, these, these rep local representatives that are focused on, um, on, on rates and, and these uh, small issues of, of where, where they're constantly terrorised about... about having a vision, being criticised for it, and um, that probably has made a difference. We've had multiple decades, in Auckland in particular, of, of local representatives that had small ideas and we're still making up for it. Uh, we built a four-lane harbour bridge. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. I no, feel, I feel I like I got depressed. Mean. I'm sorry. Anyway, people yeah, are probably alienated yeah. from the system a little bit. Yeah, because I remember, I remember reading once about um, <laughs> Mayor Robbie um, anyone remember Sir Dubmy Robinson? And he had a. You were wow. <laughs> Richard, don't did you. Vote against, <laughs> did you vote against the trams and all that? The rail. And, and he. <laughs> I remember he reading did. an article once, and he was saying that two things he really wanted to do was light rail and a line of palm trees up Queen Street. And I think most people <laughs> at that time were like, "Oh, it'll cost too much," which seems to be yeah. the public's answer to everything. Oh, well, it's the way we cover it as well. It's like, how much does it cost? You know, it's not like, what kind of city are we trying to build? And probably that has embedded quite a bad culture. I don't think your, 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 your issues are much more important, but that might be something too. It seems uh, th there was a lot of really awesome answers, and I wonder whether, it w do you think it's fair to, to kind of group up a kind of essence of all those answers as a disconnect? between the people and the process? Would, would that be a fair summation of, of, of some of those answers? Did anyone, anyone talk about how bad the postal system is for young people as well? <laughs> I think we're getting there. Yeah. yeah. That's bad too. I, I think that goes to the, the structures as well. Like, right, we're taking post boxes away from communities <laughs> while asking people to conduct a postal ballot. That's like crazy. We're, we're, yeah. Most young people haven't seen a letter. What are they, like, I mean, this is the thing. You've got, like, you've got a postal system. You've got 80 year olds that have lived in the same house for 40 years. They're, getting, they're going to be enrolled. They're going to be in the same place. They're going to get their voting papers sent. A young person might have moved flat four times in the last three years. That's because they got kicked out by the, by the guy that's been living in his house for 40 years. <laughs> it's their investment property. Um, so, I mean, 
I don't I don't have the solution to what's a better system, but it's a... Wow, I'm from Invercargill, <laughs> and if you may have noticed that I talk a bit different, and I feel that these are really Auckland-related issues, <laughs> and I don't know what our two Wellington colleagues are... Got, got it. Because <laughs> I was just thinking that mm. uh, in Invercargill, for example, um, it has, I, I think, it's about 85% participation rate in voting, but that's possibly because they've got such a, a, a big personality with Mayor Tim Shadbolt. And um, when he first came into um, the city council down in Invercargill, he had said that he was going to um, push a, a, um, a concrete mixer um, through the main streets of Invercargill. He was quite clever because he didn't define what main streets were and he only went up and down one particular street. But all the elderly, all the young people... All the people in between, they all went and saw him push. I went, and I was about mm. five. Was there not much else happening in, in the dark <laughs> So it's, uh, it's the same. On this day, I, Marina. I, I got the same theory on, why. It's, the it's why the, pushing a concrete mixer. It, Let's all go out. It's why the blues suck, because there's too many things to do in Auckland. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're in the deep south, you've got some good, strong rugby teams down there. Yeah. There's not much else to do. I guess... Let's, I mean, um, there's so many fantastic questions coming in, and I'll get to some of those after this next round of questions from each of you. Um, the talk always turns to solutions. Laura, what could central and local government do to make participating in democracy more meaningful and, and inclusive, given we all want that, and we all accept that it's going to take a culture change? So I think there's a number of things. I do think education is one part of it. Um, I do stress that it is just one part of it, though, um, because uh, whilst I think, like, the US has had civics education in their schools quite a long time, it's not exactly... Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I think citizenship uh, is one part of it, and when I say that, I'm, when I say citizenship, I mean it goes beyond civics. It's not just, like, the mechanics of local government or central government and how it works and how many MPs there are and what a select committee is and all that kind of stuff. It's like the power of social movements. Who is Eva Rickard? What was Parihaka? How did that happen? All those sorts of things. Fashion Point. You know, I think it would be really awesome to learn about um, social movements and the role that uh, that people, ordinary people, have played in um, affecting change in New Zealand. So I think that's one part of it. I also think it's about practice from a young age. So still in high schools, we don't actually, young people um, don't actually get to vote for who their head boy or the head girl is. Um, they get to vote for their student representative on the board of trustee, um, but they don't vote for the head boy or head girl that's appointed. And so we don't even actually practice voting in schools, which seems quite flawed. I never um, knew that. So the teachers picked the head Wow, wow. Yeah, they do. And then for the student, the person who does end up getting onto the board of trustees, the student rep, they're usually just one person among, you know, six to 12 parents um, or adults. And um, and then so they're the lone voice. And so their, ex their first experience of governance isn't necessarily that great either because they're the sole voice advocating for that. And so I think at the school level, it will be really great to put in place that we have two student representatives um, on each board so that they feel supported in that. Um, so I think there's a couple of structural things that we could do. Um, but I also think, like, one of the reasons why I think voter turnout is higher in places like Invercargill is because there's still quite strong community ties there. And in a population as diverse and, um, and widespread as Auckland, it's quite hard to achieve those community ties. Um, and there's a really interesting and quite terrifying piece of research that was done by uh, Unitech um, in West Auckland um, studying um, people's responses to... Um, of perceptions of crime in their community and then um, support for certain responses um, to those perceptions of crime. And basically what they found is that um, older Pākehā, usually men who spent a lot of time on social media, were more likely or more inclined to support punitive measures. In that, so they were more likely, A, to think that there was more crime in their community and that their communities were more affected by crime and then therefore to more likely to support um, more policing in that area whereas more uh, people who uh, people of colour from those same communities were less likely to f perceive that there was a lot of crime in their um, community um, and also therefore more likely to support uh, greater investment in community events. And so one, uh, alongside um, ethnic um, background being one of the things, it was also about social media use. And, and so I think um, if, we, if we think about the role that um, social media plays in 
it, it's meant to bring us together, but it also is um, radicalizing some people and um, pushing us into bubbles and sort of isolating us. Um, how can we use the tools that we have today, and this is something that I think Carl's really great at, the, 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 the internet to bring communities closer together rather than polarize us and push us apart? Thank you, Lord Carl. Um, generally speaking, the, the younger you are, it seems the least likely you are to vote. There's all these usual stereotypes about young people, lazy, self-absorbed. That's just me. Um, or are there other reasons they don't turn out to vote? Um, Noam Chomsky was on um, Radio New Zealand a couple of years ago talking to Kim Hill, and he made a really, really important point that there are more young people engaged in direct political action and activity now than in 1968. And when we think about 20th century history in the late 60s, we imagine this like this zeal and this you know revolutionary moment in time, and there are more young people engaged in direct political action and activity now than there were in the late 60s. They just do it differently. And this goes back to the structure and the, the, of, of, the, of the, the tools, the levers that they have to pull. They're more likely to be conscious consumers. They're more likely to be activists or take direct um, action towards a, a, an act of an, a, an, oil, um, a, a, an oil company or a, a sweatshop using you know, company. They're more likely to take a direct type of action um, than they are to wait three years to tick a box right. and hope. They're all about right. doing something now. They want to do something now, but they, but but I think that's really important um, because we do we underutilize this talent. We've got this wonderful t pool of talent. And they've also got the most to uh, gain or lose, right? They're going to be alive the longest. Um, if we fuck it up now, they're the ones who've got to live with the consequences. And if we get it right now, they're the ones who get to you know to reap the rewards of, of what of, of the investment now, even if it is a higher cost, you know. And that's the thing which the media foreground. But um, um, the kids are all right, and I think that um, after Christchurch, we saw that. And I think a lot of um, older voters um, were really impressed by the Rangatahi in Christchurch. People Street. just love hating on young people, eh? Y yeah, but, I, but, but they, they don't turn out, but I'm going to say, this is my one point I want to labour, because this is my, my co-papa. You've already quoted Noam Chomsky. Fuck it. Awesome. Um, 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 so if I look at how young people um, are educated in schools today, they're taught to be collaborative, deliberative, to reach consensus, and to work together to build something. And then I look at how politics is presented. It's adversarial, it's red versus blue, blood versus crips. Parliament is two tribes separated by a man with a mace. That's some Game of Thrones shit, you know? Like, like, and, 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 and we, we expect our young people who have this different education to look at that and go, I'm in. Um, and, and they're not. And I, so I think the better behaved um, politicians, and we are in civics, and how we talk about it. Um, the more deliberative and, and open and honest and evidence-based that we can be, the more we're going to get those Rangatahi to, to vote, because they are engaged, they're just not ticking the box. Can I ask Paul a question then? What, what do you think uh, the difference of um, our young uh, central government MPs makes, like Chloe Swarbrick, for example? I reckon, and that lies the, the seed of actually getting them to tick the box. Um, I, I think we need to make a compelling argument that um, once you're inside the tent, once you're sitting at the table, we can evolve these things that they're not concrete. There's a, there's a sense that these things are immutable, unchangeable, um, you know, um, processes and structures and systems and traditions, but they can all be changed. And watching, uh, when I see cross-party, you know, the homosexual law reform was a good example. When I see this cross-party consensus and stuff coming together, that's what gets them going. So, you know, I, I think people like Chloe, you know, it's a really good example of, of someone going into the tent and changing things from the inside. Um, but, I, yes, yeah, so I think it's, it, it's, you know, it's that old thing in social justice, just as if I can't see it, I can't be it, right? So that little bit of modelling, I think, is really, really good. Um, Laura, you mentioned crime before, and last week there was an incident at St Luke's, and it was very sad for the people that were affected that the Michael Hill Jewelers was broken into. But on the other hand, the young offenders caught the train. Um, so they're using public transport, which, which is great. They caught the train to Ranui. Not casting aspersions on people from Ranui. Um, Marina. Uh, in, in the, uh, at the last Auckland local government elections, there were approximately 70% of European voters who voted European, I guess that means Pākehā as well, not just people from Europe. <laughs> um, however, for other ethnicities, the participation was significantly lower in the Chinese community, 57% of voters. Uh, for Māori, 
for Samoan, 46%. What can we do to increase voter participation across all ethnicities, given that and when you look at Māori, Pacific and Asian, they make up 50% of Auckland's population and, and there are over 200 ethnicities in Auckland? Um, that's a good question. Um, one of the things is that in the 2013 census, and I'm not going to talk about 2018 census because I keep getting told off, um, but in the 2013 census there was 87,000 people who couldn't speak English. Um, and they were, sorry, 80,000 people in Auckland who couldn't speak any English. They didn't have any English-speaking ability. They, they weren't ESOL, English is a second language, they just couldn't speak it. And one of the things about those stats that you just said, Oscar, is that we need to make it easier for people with English as a second language or no language, no English, to, to vote. And um, I could bore you with um, Regulation 34 of the local election regulations. I love that one. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Remind me. Yeah. Remind us. <laughs> Which says um, that uh, you have to um, be able to vote. Um, you can have a, a special vote um, if you can't speak English. Um, but the other op option is uh, the other concern about that regulation is that that it doesn't say any requirements for the person that is uh, with you watching you doing or translating uh, that uh, vote for you. They don't have any obligation to keep your vote a secret. So. Um, we at the Super Diversity Institute, we've done some research and we've seen that um, quite a lot of people are put off by the fact that their translator could then tell their vote to every man and his dog. So I think making um, the enrolment forms uh, accessible to different languages, I think, did you say that there were, there's 163 different languages spoken in Auckland? Um, so making uh, the enrolment information uh, different languages um, and then making the voting, voting forms in different languages. I mean, I know that we do have like Māori, Pacifica, Chinese, but there are 163 different languages. What do you think, what, hello, sorry. What do you think about automatic um, enrolment, meaning that any, so if you like get a driver's licence or a passport or anything like that, then they automatically enrol you and so then it's opt out rather than opt in? That's a fantastic idea, yeah. Are you, are, you, are you running this year? Yeah. <laughs> uh, something that I obviously support and am proposing. Uh, I just, I think it's such a, and I've thought, like, so I'm in stakeholder management, and you think about um, when you're impacting communities, the, the, the links you go to for just different engagement or partnership plans for all types of communities, um, whether it's building the Waterview Tunnel, you think about all the schools, communities, ethnicities, all that, and you, you are consciously coming up with ways of how you include them within that. And we probably, you know, you, the Invercargill to Auckland phase is we are so disconnected. And I think um, um, we probably have got a long way to go in terms of coming up with um, uh, recognising the different cultural values and how then um, particularly voting or local government might impact those values and why you would get enthused and... There's, I mean, that's that, that's a task for a small army in itself. But um, uh, yeah, if you could tackle that, that that would be another good good initiative. When I when I look at those stats, you know, when you think of the chunk of the community that isn't being represented, um, and I guess this that's quite sad. And um, sorry, Mar Marine, I'll come back to you in a sec. But Michael. How does voter turnout impact the quality of elected members? Yeah, this is... Well, so I was guilty by association, being an elected member. Um, and I guess, look, I, I would put almost my business hat on when I think about this, because often a lot of people think, oh, well, why would I vote from the voting side? <clears throat> when you're an elected member, who's your market? Right, so who, who's your voting market? So if you're in business, you've got a product, who are you marketing it to? Um, and it's not too dissimilar. And I, I've, got, there's a, I've got a lot of friends even in this room who are elected members, and they're, they're probably part of the, the cream, you know, uh, from, from all extremes, um, but they're the types of elected members you probably want who are active, um, engaged. They, not, they might not be my way inclined or 
I might not agree, but actually I don't care because they're just engaged and they're representing their community. Good job. But how many times do I talk to a politician and you talk about an issue and you kind of know socially where it should be at and they're like, oh, but why would I? They don't vote. Like, why would I? I'm not going to go down that. Like, I'm not going to go fight in that corner. So did you, else. like, fo focus on the people that you know do turn out or? Well, I, I think I was an outlier only in the fact that somehow I could get in. But um, I felt very lonely or isolated even in this beast of council because I felt like I represented a silent, un, you know, a silent, um, major well, not majority, but just my community, to be honest. But my community weren't engaged at all. So often, you know, you go years on end in this beast trying to represent people that aren't there. They're not there to vote. They're not, they don't care. And so you're kind of the only one sort of holding your hand up and... And so that's an outlier, I think, view, where you could look at the other 80% of your elected representatives and I don't need to ask the question, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not proud of our, our entirety of elected members. Like, it could be a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, you know, like, it's not... Richard Hills before Richard Hills, eh? But I'm not, you know, and I, it's not, you know, that's, I'm just not... I'm not that way inclined to stay in there and be that. And there's others that are here today that are. You know, they're, they're fighting the fight, man. And even to go through silly season right now in elections, it's not a nice place to be in. Um, so it's, I, I think we, we know that we have very low turnout and we know the quality of our elected members. We know the quality of our decision makers. We know. And there's something inherently broken. Now, what's going to change that? A bigger market. So from an elected member's point of view, or from a voter point of view, you inherently want more people to vote because that's the change, that's the accountability, that's the exposure, that's the interest, that's the engagement. And I think that would only lead to um, more contestability and uh, more people being interested in running. And um, you, I think you would still get people electing those parts of the community that need to be, um, and right through to having good quality decision makers, which leads to... Um, you know, yeah, leads to better outcomes. So it does affect the quality of... 100%. 100%. Do we want to stay in at 38% and um, turn up to a local board meeting and um, only three of them are actually engaged? It's the incentives, eh? Like, I feel like some councillors that are doing really good progressive change are almost doing kind of charity work in a way because they're just making it harder for themselves. <laughs> like, the, because you look at the stats, I you can go into them. I wrote them down. But, like, I mean, the, the easy way to get in is to appeal to old Pakia people. And, I mean, and... Mine, and mine was a middle-aged woman. <laughs> yeah, honestly, nice, yeah. Honestly, a great voter turnout from my area, and it was like, whoa, that's the easy market. Oh, that came out real bad. <laughs> but that was... Tap to the cougar market. Like, I didn't know this would go there. No, I, I guess that's like, smart, yeah, though, Michael. Yeah. I guess that's I might clever. leave now. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, they vote. They vote. There's an easy way to get... You know, if you're a local board, you, you can get in on 1,000 votes. 1,000 votes. Is that all? Yeah, if that, in some local board areas. I'm so running. it's like, well, actually... <laughs> to, I think this is the other thing. People think it's a lot more daunting or a lot bigger than what it actually is. If you think you can represent your community better, no matter where you're from what age you are, you've got a real good shot of getting in. Like, it's pretty incredible. That's actually really it's encouraging. Hey. You're going to, you do it. Go on. Yeah. I will. <laughs> you hear it here. I've got till tomorrow. Yeah. Um, Marina, I saw you have your, your mic up before. Were you going to chime in with something? Oh, no, yeah. I was going to say that, well, adding to um, Michael's question about quality of candidates, I mean, given that Auckland is 50% uh, Asian Pacific and Māori, we need to see more people or more representation in our candidates from those communities. Um, as Michael says, you know, there are a lot of Pākehā. Oh, I remember um, uh, Hekia Parata used to say um, that they're pale, stale males. And there are a lot of pale... Sorry, say that again? Pale... Stale and male. Whoa, full also, on. Also known as the CEOs of all the CCOs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to, I want to, I want to get to some of these questions that have come through. Uh, and 
here's a really interesting one. Um, why not make voting compulsory? I think if you're going to make voting compulsory, you have to make space for people who don't see themselves represented in any of the options available. Because um, if you're making people do something by compulsion, um, I don't know. Firstly, I feel quite uncomfortable about that um, for words I can't for reasons I can't yet articulate. But the yeah, like so there's a there's a cool um, TED talk that's put forward by I can't remember his name. He's a UK journalist, and he talks about this idea that what if um, what if uh, so there's 120 seats in central government and parliament, and um, let's say 30% of people don't vote, then the equivalent number of seats would have to stay empty, and then political parties and candidates would have to try and find out what those 30% of people who didn't vote actually want, and then try and vie for their votes, which I think would be a much more kind of responsive, uh, participatory way of um, uh, of running things, as opposed to like just forcing people into choosing options, in which case, if they're forced to choose an option, where's the option to say, I don't like any of you, um, you know? And so I think that that aspect of things is quite important. But on the diversity thing in Auckland, I think, like, one of the other things to, to note is that's really important about um, is class. So um, in 2015, Statistics New Zealand um, found that the median net worth of, a, of, a, of an individual Pākehā person was 114000 um, median Māori, 23,000. Median Pacifica person, 14,000. And so you have a $100,000 gap between the median Pacifica person and the oh, median Pacifica. Oh, it's like Pakia. we're all actors. Yeah. And so, <laughs> um, and, so, and so we have to think about, like, uh, like one of the things I've been thinking quite a lot about with the election access funding bill that Mojo Mathers put through, which is basically um, a pool of funds that candidates and political parties can apply for, it's in its second reading in central government at the moment, um, to make their events uh, more accessible to people with disabilities. So if you're a person with disability, uh, with a disability who wants to run for um, central or local government, you can apply for that. If you're um, wanting a person to do sign, um, inter sign language interpretation at your event, you can apply for that, so on and so forth. And I started thinking about what would it look like if we had a, an equivalent fund for young people um, for ensuring that um, young people can actually participate because um, we have these huge ethnic gaps in, um, a, or a racial wealth gap, let's say, um, but we also know from that same statistics New Zealand data that young people um, overall have the lowest median net worth of all age demographics. So um, it's about $1,000. Many have accumulated student debt and don't have any assets yet. And so if we're serious about getting more young people to, to participate, we have to wrap the support around them so that they can actually do that. And it's the, and you know, and, and so that's for young people, but also for people from different um, ethnic backgrounds as well. Who else would like to chime in on that? Why don't we make voting compulsory? Is that a, is that, is that a road we could take? I, I think we could do better than that. I, I think it's a little bit like kiss your auntie stuff. Like, it, it's, it, like democracy is pretty special and a lot of people have fought very hard for it, and and um, it's a it's an amazing privilege to be part of. And I think if we did all the things which have been suggested, we teach civics better, we empower people, we engage them, we use the tools and techniques that we have better um, and uh, more deliberately and more openly. And um, I think we don't need to do that. I, I think that making it compulsory has it worked know. in Aussie. Well, no, it hasn't worked in Aussie. And 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 the like, the quality of vote, which is an awful thing to say, but the quality of vote is low. And I'm actually that's you know, Aussies though. Yeah, yeah, but um, but um, but 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 the um, I, I'm actually okay with someone electing the values judgment, but I'm actually okay with someone electing not to vote if they've thought right. about it, they've seen the options, they've enrolled, you know, and they've actually they've actually spoiled the ballot, they've made some kind of you know um, protest vote. I'm okay with that. Um, I think it's a valid political act, um, and and I, I I don't think that you know forcing me to kiss my auntie is the way to you know. Bring what some if romance. your auntie's hot? <laughs> she, she's not. I saw. I really, I really like what you said. I hope your oh, auntie's God, not watching. Um, <laughs> no, I really. I just wanted to reinforce what Laura yeah. said. We we're about you. We, we, you, it's an opt-out system. Yeah. Uh, instead of an opt-in, sounds really good. It sounds like a compromise between the two extremes. We are now. It's almost impossible for some people to vote. Who knows how to use a postal box? And, you know, where you actually have to make a considered decision if you don't want to vote. Hey, do we all know... Can I just jump in? Sorry, yeah, sorry. sorry. I, I, I think we don't want to, like, you know, skim over this postal thing too. Like, even within, you know, Ruhi, you know, in, in Wellington we have STV, 
a different system from first past the post in Auckland. Um, the complications of working out how that system works. You know, if we do get these rangatahi engaged and involved and they're there and they're ready and then we ask them to work out the magic strategy of how am I going to cast this vote and what's the impact going to be, you know, let alone getting to the postal bat, you know, post box, wherever the fuck that is, you know, but, um, but, but, but that's a complex system. Um, that's why John Key's flag referendum was such a service <laughs> to the nation, you know. What do you really mean? taught us about STV. Ranking. <laughs> <laughs> Hayden, um... Same concept. Uh, we, you know, I mean, I feel like, you know, this is a room with a big choir who, who, who realise this is important and, and we know these things are going to take time and a culture shift, but I guess, Hayden, what's... What do you... You know, this election's next month, you know, and there are things that need to be, uh, you know... I mean, it'd be great if we could suddenly overnight flip the turnout so that the next election had a higher um, participation. What do you think is at stake at this election, particularly for Auckland's young people? Uh, I, think, I think, first of all, it's um, just representation. I, th I mean, what are the stats? The, I wrote them down. I mean, the average age on council, I'm going to read it. 75% uh, of candidates are over 45 76% uh, of elected representatives are Pākehā compared to 60% of Auckland's population. It's reasonably dire, and I've kind of got to be in my bonnet lately. You'll be surprised, but um, just about the number of projects that council handles, and Richard will know this, you'll know this, that, 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 that are for the distant future, the 30-year projects, you're thinking about rail to the North Shore, and these are things, these are projects that are primarily for young people. I'm sorry, old people, but you are going to die. And they are the ones that are primarily deciding whether we in the future are going to be able to have cycleways and rail over, over the heart. Come on. It's ridiculous. Of course we should, but they put it off. You know, it, we, we are letting people that won't have a stake in the future decide our future. And I find that a little bit annoying though I think they should probably still have votes. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, think, I mean, well, just the other point is I just think that the, 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 the council in particular, and this is boring probably to anyone but me who's a sad nerd, but like the council's in a reasonably precarious situation this time around. I think there's been a consensus over the last probably six years, which is in favour of a compact city based around public transport, you know. Uh, and that's been advanced in a really, even though it's probably felt really slow, but for a re a, there's been reasonable progress on that. And if a few electorates this time around flip, eh, then that could go away. Or There's lots of people in local government that have made whole careers out of saying no to things. Because it's easy and it's popular and it appeals to all the Pākehā voters. I'm really sorry, but there's a, there are a crew out there that just want to say no to things and want to hold back change and it's conservative. Mm. And I think that is a risk and you can see it a little bit in the mayoral race, not that that's the main thing, but where John Tamahiri is accusing Kilgoff of having an anti-car strategy and this kind of thing. It's this, let's pull it back and let's make Auckland what it used to be. And we've tried that way of thinking. We tried it for multiple decades and it's why our city is fucked now. <laughs> and it's what we're trying... <laughs> we're trying to be conservative. And we made a four-lane harbour bridge and we pulled up the tramways and we... Um, and so, yeah. I mean, that, it's not that dramatic, but I, um, I want to sound a warning. Can I just jump in a bit? Because yep. I, don't, I don't think it's that bleak. Um, quite it that bleak. It was a bit apocalyptic. Bit I'm really sorry. I just think um, we're in a really interesting time, I think, um, particularly in local government sense, particularly in Auckland sense. I think um, I wouldn't have rerun out of the old Rodney District Council if the super city hadn't happened. And um, I think the super city it sort of jacked the votes a bit because it was of interest. Um, and then it went straight back down to probably trending the wrong way. I think the last three years has been probably the first solid three years of elected members on social and communicating in a completely different way. So I think in 2000 and whenever it was, I think, um, and you know, we're 
we were throwing around um, Facebook signs on on our billboards, and we were the only ones doing it. We are now. I, I probably only think it's the last three years that I think elected members have sort of switched on to using it properly to engage with communities. So much easier to get to know a representative, not just the BS that they put through and X amount of words and a pamphlet that comes out before elections. So I, I, I do hope that that it is it is um it's coming back. And you think about some of the real hot issues that have been floating around the city, not just in this in central, and even the play over all the investments coming to central, what does that mean for Rodney or um or Manukau or wherever it would be, I think these are starting to, you're starting to get a little bit more involvement. Now the major hurdle to that is just um, decent participation. So, you know, we put out an annual plan and you've still, the, uh, the, we've, we've touched on it, the archaic nature of how we engage with, um, which often is actually guided by legislation around what does a submission look like and blah, blah, blah. Actually, there's way better ways to tap into communities to actually have active civic participation, and and we're still stuck in this sort of self-perpetuating um, system that isn't allowing you to actually, um, yeah, isn't allow allowing you to sort of penetrate in and make a well, what you think is make a difference. So I'd hope that, and I've been I've been described as unnatural optimistic. So I'll just put that out there. I've heard that about you. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's my uh, bio on one of those social places. Um, but I, I think there's going to be a bit of turnout this year. Think about Takapuna, Manukau, some of these quite hot issues and the involvement that council has in that. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a better turnout. And I think, um, I think the fact that we are getting a lot more exposure, it is a lot more front of mind beyond the local rag. I, I would think that um, we are on a hopefully a better, a better transition, hopefully. Uh, a question's come through here. Why is electronic voting not available in this election cycle? This is um, I, now, I think Marguerite could maybe speak more to that when she wraps up, but I, I think there, there was a move by a group of councils in the North Island, but the cost was prohibitive and cost too much, and central government wouldn't come in, so I think it was shelved. But do you think that's a good idea? Do you think central government does need to come to the party or, or, or that it's in council's best interest to actually make this a reality? Well, how do you define best interest? Because you could cut that a lot of, lot of different ways. Government could change that overnight, honestly. There's so many more sensitive transactions I've done in the last week online than the risk around who I'm going to vote for in my local elections. And I'm, I'm not... I'm not an IT whiz, I don't know two ways about anything, but surely there's a lot of, a lot of levers and mechanisms we could pull. Um, I, I don't, it's part of my reason I kind of like a bit even disconnected from all that. Like it's, it seems to be such a no-brainer. I just don't get why it hasn't been done. Even if it does cost a few million. I don't, um, I don't, think, I don't think it would work. Um, because it, so in Estonia they've had e-voting for quite a while and it had a great effect on turnout at the beginning when it was novel and then it's done what all the other democracies have done and voter decline has continued. And so, um, and if we had it, we'd have to do it with our Realme accounts, which is actually not that easy. <laughs> um, uh, and so, like, I don't actually think it would be lowering that many barriers. I actually worry quite a lot about the tech. Um, because all of my friends who are very tech savvy um, worry about it, and so I just sort of trust them. Um, and and it's sort of one of those things like you could put it online, but it fundamentally doesn't fix all of the inequities that I've been describing today about the reasons why people don't vote. It doesn't fix colonisation. It doesn't fix intergenerational distrust between the Crown and Māori. It doesn't um, you know fix the driver licensing issue, which is one of the issues one of the reasons people, young people, particularly in rural areas, don't vote is they just simply cannot get to a place to vote because they don't have their own cars or they don't have a driver's licence um, or they have to work on the farm and no one's going to take them to post their vote or give their vote or things like that. So, yeah, moving voting online won't fix any of those problems. And I think it's one of those things that we sort of jump to as a silver bullet, but it's, there's no such thing. I know that I said that I was gonna, wasn't going to mention it, but 2018 census. <laughs> I mean, it's just... And, I mean, I know that, you know, having talked to Liz McPherson, the chief statistician, yeah, there were lots of 
positive learnings that came out of their first online survey, uh, online census, but they didn't have a high turnout. I mean, I would agree with um, online or e-voting if it was coupled with postal and if it was coupled, coupled with ballot boxes. I mean, you, you couldn't just have it by itself. And if I could add one thing to that, if you're going to make online voting the only way of voting, then internet access becomes a human right, you know, and that's a big commitment. Um, and just to Hataka, what you're saying about trust, I think trust is vital. Um, a lot of this is to do with, and this is the pointy-headed stuff, it's to do with the social contract, and even the language used, I, 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 that, you know, and I know I'm in Auckland, but we're talking about the market and, you know, talking about, you know, customers and stuff. These are citizens we're talking about, and I think that language matters, and it's part of the social contract which, which can be broken. And post-Cambridge Analytica, you know, post-Brexit and the interference and, you know, fake news and all that stuff, there is a trust issue, and if we do put voting online, we're taking a really sacred and important thing, and we're putting it into a space that people don't trust, um, increasingly don't trust. Um, and, and I worry about that. I, I, I hold this, this, this act of voting, you know, really high. Um, and if, if anything, I'd do the opposite. I'd, 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 I'd ceremonialise it. I'd make it like a, a, an event, make it a really cool thing. Like free do. beers. Fuck, I don't care. Like free number one pancakes, man. Like, <laughs> like, 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 like but, um, but, some, but, but, but I, I think that the silver bullet is, is just a really tempting quick fix. I guess I wasn't. In, it was. It's just one tool. I think that should be. It feels so archaic the way that we are, and it was just another tool. And. Honest, and actually, the trust thing is really interesting. I was talking to a mate about putting his money in Kiwi Bank, and even that, he was like, "No way, it's government." And even I was sort of like, "There's such an, there is something entrenched and inherent in this trust issue," and I think that does play a big part in it. That's yeah. Hayden's face. He's cringing. Oh, yeah. Hayden, why are you cringing? Oh no, no, I just think oh, he should put his money in Kiwi Bank. It's fine. <laughs> 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 On <laughs> scary, yeah. yeah, no, on this, I mean, there's, uh, I just think that probably an, an on-the-day ballot would be a useful addition, at least in the same style as a national election. Because, come on, that, I mean, that's... And, and people should have time off to go to it. And we should encourage that. And, I mean, that, that would probably increase things overall. And I think that Labour has recently announced that they're going to have ballot boxes on the day at um, countdowns and pack and saves and that. That would probably help a lot as well if you could enroll the vote after doing your shop and, mm. uh, and, and the, cast a I, special vote. I think the council has, I mean, they're, they're doing lots of things, but they've got these things called one-stop shops where if you miss enrolment, which is tomorrow, in order to get your postal um, papers, you can still enroll on the day and vote straight away. And they're going to be at places like the night markets or the malls or places where the community gathers. So it's not from a lack of trying, I feel. Um, here's an interesting question. I guess it, it's kind of been part of the national discussion as well, but it's just an interesting question to think about. But prisoners voting. Ooh, yes. Marina made her face. <laughs> Laura? I mean, yes, obviously they should vote because... Um, and also we should abolish prisons. Um, <laughs> so... I know one's less, uh, yeah. You know, it's that thing where you propose a much more radical idea to make that one seem far less radical. Um, but we should, by 2040, abolish prisons. Um, no, I think, um, I mean, it's been found to be, un, it's, it's like it goes against human rights. It's found to be unconstitutional. Um, and, and the Waitangi Tribunal report found that it is disproport it's, it's a breach of the treaty. Um, and so, to me, it seems like a no-brainer. Um, and I'm assuming that the reason that Jacinda has come out with the position that she's come out with is because of New Zealand First and their um, desire to keep the law and order votes. Um, and I just wish there was a bit of honesty in um, the coalition about that because it's so obvious that that's the reason why. And I just wish she was like, you know, I really support this, but Winnie's holding me back. And I just feel that that would be a much more authentic like, statement <laughs> than what has been said. And I find that frustrating. Justice approach, like we we claim to be a restorative justice nation, and and if we're going to want someone to feel that their the job of being the job of being in prison, the, the their role, you know, their side of the bargain of being in prison is to leave, you know, um, ready to re-engage with society, that it's to you know it's to engage as citizens. So you know to 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 have this sort of arbitrary connection disconnection from you know um, civic life and civic society. I, I don't know, it doesn't make sense to me. I'd much rather, it'd be worse to make them read books about 
local body politics. Like, <laughs> like do the, like, like, Just make them all read spin-off. Give them, my, give them my section. Give them my section. Oh, man, they make them read Hayden's section of spin-off. <laughs> um, yeah, it does seem a bit odd, that one. Um, and, and going back to something you said earlier, Laura, it, it, our, low, our low participation rate is that a symptom and rather than treating the symptoms. I mean, yeah, prison is, a, is an example of us treating the symptoms. So like over 90% of the people that we lock in prisons have a mental health distress or addiction issue. Um, seven, I think it's 64% of people have had some kind of traumatic brain injury compared to just 2% of the general population. And so prison is our failure to adequately fund mental health. And, um, and so we just sort of put them there and lock them away and then be like, and by the way, you can't vote. And so, like, I think we have this tendency to just to be like, oh, we should just put the voting online and it will fix it, you know, and not actually deep delve into the complexity of things and, and to focus on early intervention and prevention instead of punishment and, you know, closing the gap of, in wealth in our country and um, acknowledging the deep harms that have been done by colonisation and working on a path towards intergenerational healing collectively. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm always bringing it real down, eh? <laughs> Um, Hayden, say something funny. No, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we tend to treat symptoms and not root causes, and I think as long as we keep going with that approach, we will continue to have the same problems over and over again. I've got a, a, a it's not really a question, but someone said, it's great that young people participate directly, but if they don't vote, they let the old conservatives control the agenda. Um, I feel like, you know, some of my good mates are older white guys, and in terms of, um, you know, we can't punish the people that do vote or that do turn up, but let's say we don't get the ideal world and we don't get the quality of candidates that's fully representative of our city, what can, I mean, it, that's not what this is about, but what can those councillors do to actually engage with the community voices that aren't being represented perhaps as fully on council? Not that that's our job to tell councillors how to reach out to oh, people. So, oh, so I, I, I'm, I think partly maybe this goes back a little bit to what you were talking about with young people with direct democracy. Um, I find it, I just want to, as an aside, I find it quite funny that there's more people engaged in direct democracy now because I always think the teenagers in 1968 became the boomers of today and I'm like, oh, there's a disconnect there. I'm like, now it makes sense. Um, but like, um, but, you, but you, when, when you see Generation Zero sort of engaging people on Skypath or something, you get this massive uh, feedback that actually did make a difference to counsellors and... and, and that was actually the figure. I knew that. 11,115. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the, the thing is, and, and so it was 11,000 to 100 in terms of the submissions in favour of Skypath. And those people, most of those people, that 11,000 people that uh, submitted probably didn't vote statistically. Um, but, but the sheer overwhelming support for that probably did sway council in a lot of ways, and, and so there probably is that opportunity even post the election to influence things if that direct democracy is employed correctly. And in terms of what councillors can do when that happens, um, is, like, because I, I used to be a member of Generation Zero Auckland, and um, I remember some of my friends went for their first ever submission to Auckland Council and got yelled at, and there was this video that went viral, and they were just like, yeah, young people don't know what you're talking, and it wasn't by the crowd, it was by councillors who disagreed with them. And so, like, if we want to, yeah, so that's one thing, that if, you're, if, you, if you get in and then young people come to engage in the processes, don't yell at them. Um, but also I think the role of civil society organisations like Generation Zero is really important, and that's where I come back to this idea of, because the struggle for civil society organisations, because I run one and co-founded one, is, um, is funding. And so that's where I think, again, the youth... Um, participation access funding bill or something similar would really help as a structural um, solution to help get these groups the funding that they have so that they can be sort of a bridge between citizens and um, the institutions that represent citizens because, um, yeah, I think, I think those bridges are really, really important, but they're doing it on the side of a uni uh, degree whilst also 
you know, a part-time job while also trying to have some kind of social life. And what ends up happening is you just mix your social life with your activism and, um, and that's cool. But, um, but it is also nice to not have to necessarily stress to pay the rent and all those sorts of things. Yeah. One of the things that I was thinking of was my stepdaughter, she goes to school down in uh, Lower Hutt in Wellington and um, her local MP at that time, it was Trevor Mallard, um, came to her school and um, she didn't know who he was. He talked, stood around for photos and then left and then the class just were interested to find out more about what he, what he was and uh, what he did and all that sort of thing. And I feel like it's so cliche, um, having worked in a minister's office before, but just if uh, politicians, either central or local politicians, if they go to their schools, and this is also what I dig about civil education, uh, civics e education, if they go to schools and meet the school students, then that will excite them, that will interest them in the political process um, and about what a politician does and about what uh, or why it's important to vote. But I, I just feel that um, there are a lot of schools. I mean, well, there's over 2,000 secondary schools in New Zealand. So that's a lot of, like, eating sausage rolls and drinking cups of tea. That they Do you have think the, we should lower the age to 16? It's just come through on Slider? Yes. Why? Who said yes? Was that you, Hayden? I thought we all said, oh, sorry. I thought <laughs> I was saying it with anyone else. <laughs> I don't ever, I'm oh, sorry, I, I could uh, I think right yes, there. but with a, the caveat of civics education in schools. You know, I'm happy for a 16 year old to drive on the caveat that they're trained to drive, you know, so so I think it's tied in one another. Mm. Without civics education in schools and without that other supporting infrastructure around it, um, I think I, I'm a bit more tentative, but, um, but, you know, hey. I think of it the same way I think about the disenfranchisement of prisoners in a, sa in a, in a sense that we should find reasons there should be really good reasons to disenfranchise someone out and our first option should always be to enfranchise someone, not to disenfranchise someone. And, the, and 16 year olds, I mean, Lord was 16 when she wrote Royals, you know, so, I mean, they're not dumb. And, and, and also the, the logic around the developing brain and they're too young and they can't make good choices, I, unfortunately, if you put the other end of the life spectrum, you can apply much of that to, um, so, you know, touche. I would never say something like yeah. that. Also, in um, Scotland, when they had the referendum about whether or not Scotland should leave the UK, they lowered the voting age to 16 for it, and the turnout of 16 and 17 year olds was 75%, yeah. which is pretty awesome. So, yeah, I think that's pretty good reason to do it. And, and, and that goes into so my, my, my area of expertise is, is this little bit. If you cast a vote the first time you're given the opportunity to, a significant vote like a general election or a local body election, your children are likely to vote. If you don't cast that vote, such as the intergenerational patterns of, you know, you're oh, more likely to so not. So parents can actually be quite influential. And, and vice versa. <laughs> um, um, young people can be, young people can also be very influential on the, <laughs> their parents as well. So if they start to engage, you can break the cycle in both directions. But, ah. um, but it's a really interesting thing that um, once I engage, I've cast that vote, I either want to see how well, you know, the person I voted for performs. So I've got a horse in the race. Um, if, if, if the person I vote for doesn't get elected, I've got a sort of, you know, a reason to be watching what's going on. But, I, but I'm engaged, therefore I'm more likely to talk about it, therefore my, my far now are more likely to hear politics and um, civic discourse as it normalised, mm -hmm. therefore they're more likely to pay attention and you sort of get this lovely spiral of um, Culture change. Absolute culture change. And that's, and look, I'm looking forward to being a middle-aged Pākehā, um, white man. Um, um, and, 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 and forward? And, you know, <laughs> can, can I? <laughs> hey, um, just because we're we've got about five minutes left before Marguerite comes on to um, summarise, and I'm going to give you each a chance to kind of have one last statement about this conversation. But before I do, interesting things just come in. Not everyone is motivated by doing the right thing or the whole the fact that it's really good for us and our society. Um, some people are motivated by money. Um, do you think salary, do you think that could be a part of enticing people to run for... Um... Oh, Michael, you're like... Oh, you're yeah. literally the only one that's done it. It's so tricky. Um, don't know. It's set... Like, I took a big pay cut to go and run 
for um, for local body politics, um, which is a, a I know is a very privileged position to be in. I, I think I think it's said about right, honestly. Um, I think. I come back to, I think people think council, particularly council, is a lot more daunting. I remember working with the youth advisory panel and they kind of thought they needed to go through the motions before they might one day run for a local body, like for a local board or something. It's like, nah, man, just jump straight in. Right. Like you've got we don't necessarily want people who are only going to do it for the money. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Y yeah. Yep. But then on the other scale, I think there's people worth three times as much <laughs> on the local boards or on the councils than they are in the private sector too. So it works at both ends. So I, I, I honestly feel like sometimes we've probably, we could be sitting about right because those people that probably are in more vulnerable, not in the high, um, for them it should be in, it's, it's incentivizing and they can study and they can do, it's, it's quite an agile job. Like you can make it work for you and your um, other governors. Um, and would I like to see better quality decision making? Yes, but does that necessarily come from a higher echelon of uh, um, earners? No. So I kind of feel like it's set about right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, closing statements. Who'd like to kick us off? Hayden. Oh, well, Not Gary. I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> go back through. No, go Laura. Hi, I'm Maria. Maria. Uh, 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 <laughs> yes, please. I just wanted to say that um, from a super diverse perspective, um, it's quite important to be able to get uh, super diverse people enrolled because that's the biggest hurdle to them not voting. Um, we did, um, we've got a group that's called New Zealand Asian Leaders and it's a whole bunch of um, um, Asian leaders um, uh, from New Zealand uh, who met with Auckland Council this week. And they said that um, the majority of the issues with their communities is that nobody knows that, how to enrol. Um, because if you're not enrolled, you can't vote. So I just think we need to go back to that step of saying enrol, then vote, and what next? Thank you, Carl. I think we need to um, practice a, a kinder more open and deliberative democracy. And I think we need to model better behaviour on every level, media, uh, education. I think we need, to, we need to do better and we need to bring it back into the terms of you know, our national kaupapa that this is an um, important thing we need to foreground. I think we need to have those arguments about whether or not the council sees me as a customer or a, or a citizen. You know, I want to be a citizen, you know, not a customer. And that changes my relationship. So I think we need to have a good, long, hard look. And New Zealand's good. We have these little crux moments. We had awful ones in Christchurch recently and we, it gives us opportunity to take a good long hard look at ourselves and what we want and, and I'm looking forward to the moment we do that with civics and with citizenship and find that within our sort of national discourse that we make that space to have these you know really hard conversations and, and push things forward. Um, one little thing I want to add is just, and is, is just we, we talk a lot about ethnic groups and age and uh, lo location but increasingly the, how big data is thinking about us is in terms of psychographic in terms of mindsets. And if you drill down in the voter of non-participation, we get things like apartment dwellers and uh, 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 park our tradies. And we get these little pockets where of non-participation that are really interesting. And I think about that um, dense urban uh, future Auckland city where more and more people are going to live in apartment. Apartment dwellers don't vote. And it's because they don't have neighbours, they don't feel part of a community. There's lots of reasons why they don't wow. vote. But it's a, it's a mindset of disconnection. So I'd be really weary about just focusing on um, these really easy, observable demographic um, um, uh, identifiers and think about psychographics and who we're leaving behind psychologically, you know, psychographically. Thank you, Michael. It's a, it's a really complex environment. I think there's... Um, I, re I reckon an interesting exercise, because we're in a room full of voters by four people, would have been really interesting exercise getting them up here and just asking them questions for an hour and a half of why they don't. <laughs> I think um, the onus isn't on council, it's not on government. I think there's a real responsibility on us to put all our bullshit aside and understand that participation and involvement is better for representation and um, civic um, serving and all the things that we're probably a little bit wired towards. Um, and I think 
we've got a large responsibility. As I say, I don't mind which way you're voting or where you are. I want to know about your intent, your values, and um, you might not represent my community, but I think you need to be around that decision-making table. So I'd sort of like, particularly for the audience, I think it's about, it's not about trying to get non-voters to vote, but I think it's more about getting voting people to encourage voting. Uh, and I think that's probably my, my last message. I, you always hear about it, about how do we get non-voters to vote. Um, I think we play a far larger part in influencing other people to vote than thinking about council government and all that. So that's probably the, the last thing. I'm, yep. I just want to say that local government is cool <laughs> and it is interesting <laughs> and it is not boring. <laughs> Please stop telling me that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, it is, though. It is. I mean, it's just, it's, we're so beaten down about <laughs> local government. Oh, my God, I've, I've voted in the council election. And we're just saying, oh, have you thought about it? It's actually quite interesting. Yeah. And the people who participated in it are mostly kind of crazy and the barriers, the barriers to entry are so low that you get a really interesting mix <laughs> of people <laughs> involved in it. I just want to just want to <laughs> preach to, to I just want to be an advocate for local government being an actually interesting uh, thing to write about and study and and then maybe hopefully one day there'll be a story on the spin-off or something that will reflect that but uh yeah, there, there's also a lot of intractable <laughs> social issues and, and different things that we've covered that, about why young people don't vote. And I endorse all those as well while I'm saying this stupid stuff. Thank you, Hayden. Laura. Um, so I started off, yeah, I'm going to try and bring it back to what I started off with, which is like one of the complex reasons, and I'm going to focus on Māori, one of the complex reasons that Māori don't vote, as I've said, is because of intergenerational distrust of the Crown because of our colonial history and present. Right now in Auckland, we have, um, we have a peaceful uh, occupation or resistance happening in Ihu Mātau. One of the reasons that that situation exists now is because um, land that was confiscated in 1863, um, uh, when it became available for sale a couple hundred years, a hundred and something years later, um, rather than the Crown buying it back to gift it back to the Māori from whom it was taken, gave it to Auckland Council, and then Auckland Council um, made that area a special housing area, which... Auckland Council, to their credit, has recently expressed regret for that decision. Um, my my widow, my challenge to you all is to um, read the history of Ihu Matau, to visit the land if you can or if you haven't already, and to um, recognise that the treaty relationship is not just between the Crown and um, Māori, but it's between Pākehā and Māori, or Tōiwi, non-Māori and Māori, and that we all have an obligation to learn about the treaty, honour the treaty, and um, try and live as best we can in relationship with Tangata Whenua. Thank you. Uh, just a question before I close the session. The people that haven't voted, could I get your ha hands up? Has the stuff you've heard tonight, does that make you want to vote this time around? Awesome. Uh, we did it, guys. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, well, you, what was your answer? Aye, aye cool. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please show some love for our panellists tonight. Laura O'Connell Rapida, Carl Kane, Marina Matthews, Michael Gowdy, and Hayden Donnell. Thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to everyone that put a question through and for listening. Um, and now I'd like to invite up, for the last five minutes and 39 seconds, I'd like to ask the General Manager of Democracy Services at Auckland Council to the lectern, Marguerite Dalbet, to provide the vote of thanks. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Kia ora, good evening. So I've got the fantastic title of General Manager of Democracy Services, and that means that my responsibility is to ensure that we, develop, we deliver a free, fair election for um, the local body in, um, in Auckland next month. So I just want to very quickly, no, not quickly, actually, taking time to acknowledge my team, my elections team, who is here tonight, 
who's working very, very hard to make sure that we deliver a successful election. That's the first thing. The second thing I wanted to cover is make a couple of comments about what the panel has said and, and maybe sort of share, shed some light on some of the, the work that we've done recently. I mean, first, at a fundamental level, I, um, I will give my first word and last word to um, you, Carl. You said something that is very, very important to me and very dear to my heart, which is that voting is a privilege and actually having access to democracy is a privilege that uh, very few of us in the world have. And actually, that is why it makes it a duty to vote. And if we don't exercise that vote and we lose it one day, we'll probably regret not having fought for it. So that's the, that's the very first um, thing I wanted to, to say. The second thing is you um, all talked about the reasons why people are not voting. And I think the panel made it very clear that, and we know this from research, that there is no silver bullet to address the decline in voter participation. It's happening all around the world, so we're not unique in, in having that challenge. And there is a lot of work being done all around the world to try and, um, and address that decline. Some of the things that have been um, talked about, um, I thought I would comment on very, um, very quickly. The first one about compulsory voting. So two things, we did run a survey recently to, and this is to my knowledge the first time we were asking the question to Auckland voters about whether they would support compulsory voting. And we just wanted to take a little bit of a pulse of the Auckland population and see what they would tell us. And we were really surprised to find out that a majority of people, so overall 52% of people supported compulsory voting 35% were opposed and 12% didn't know. But actually, the proportion of 25 to 34 year old um, people who were uh, for compulsory voting was twice as much as those who were not. So, despite the fact that young people are not voting in um, as big numbers, they were actually supporting compulsory voting. So, that was kind of interesting. Um, just putting that. Um, in parallel with uh, an important point that um, Laura made, compulsory voting in itself, research has, has showed us that compulsory voting in itself does not increase voter participation. It is only if you give people the information and the education of why it's important to vote that they will exercise that vote. And the, um, the research is quite, um, quite clear there. So if we wanted to go there, we would need to do all the education. So why not do the education anyway, is, the, is another point. On lowering the voting age, so this was the same survey, we had a large majority of Aucklanders who told us that they were against it. And so just explaining to people why it would be a good idea comes back again to explaining, just equipping people to be able to vote, to have the, have the knowledge and, and information to do that. So that leads me to talk a little bit about um, our youth voting program. This is a program that Auckland Council has been running um, certainly since the 2000, 2010 elections when the, the uh, Auckland Council was created, but that program existed before in, in the legacy councils, and it is run elsewhere in New Zealand, but we are very active, and um, again, I just really want to pay tribute to some amazing people in my team and in the council are very, very passionate about it. And basically it is taking, so the, the youth voting program is developing a curriculum of, about civic participation, about civics education, that we are talking, taking sorry, to the schools in Auckland to uh, really teach young people to vote. And there was a question on Slido about, well, what do we do about voter participation between the elections? And that's a question we've asked ourselves at Auckland Council, just trying to explain to people why it's important to vote once every three years is not turning people into long-term voters, which um, has been explained by the panel about how important it is to vote the first time. If you vote the first time, you will continue to vote afterwards. So we've got more than 60 schools that are enrolled to take part um, to, into our youth voting program. And for the first time this time around, some of our schools are actually organizing candidate evenings where they're going to invite the candidates and 
get them to do, um, it's the students are actually going to ask the, the candidates why you know, they are standing and why it's important to vote and what they're actually standing for. And the um, Manurewa school is running a, um, um, the, a mayoral debate. So um, really en encourage you to have a look at our website about the youth voting program and that's our attempt to try and, and invite people to, um, to participate from a young age. I will just um, touch very quickly on online voting. So we fought very hard for the introduction of legislation that would enable online voting, and this happened last year. That legislation doesn't make online voting possible. It makes the trial of online voting possible. And in the case of Auckland, we wouldn't be able to trial online voting for the whole population because it was considered that Auckland was too big to fail. So we could only have um, tr uh, trial um, online voting for s a certain part of Auckland. We, uh, and when I say we, uh, Auckland Council with some other councils, so there were nine councils, fought very hard to try and get a, um, a trial together. It, uh, the, the plug got um, pulled at the last minute because the total bill was just too high for some of the smaller councils which were going to participate, which was a sort of a crushing disappointment in terms of um, really trying to, to advance, the, um, advance the cause. Now, I just really want to reiterate the, the point that I think you made also, Laura. Online voting is not the panacea to um, voter participation. We know that it will only increase voter participation marginally. But it will do two things. The first one is we do need to find a way to address the decline in our postal system, which is beyond 2025. We cannot reliably say that we will be able to run a postal election only through postal voting. So if we have to do a trial before we actually adopt online voting, well, we'd better get on with it pretty damn quickly. That's the first thing. And the second thing, um, the point that you made, Marina, is some really uh, interesting um, research that was done um, recently um, in Canada around the impact of online voting in local elections in Canada. And it was found to increase voter participation slightly, but also to increase that um, social divide that comes from access to the internet. And Carl, you talked about it. We saw it with the... Um, with the census, so it's really important to see online voting as one way to make voting easier for people, but certainly not the silver bullet that will save the vote. Now, I'm very much out of time, so I thought I would um, just give you those um, facts. There was a question on Slido about why the community of Parnell is actually changing wards. To the person who asked that question, I'm very happy to talk to you about it afterwards. This is all about um, representation and as part of democracy one of the things that we need to do is to ensure that um, an equal number of voters get represented by their elected representatives and what we are seeing in Auckland which is posing some really interesting um, challenges is the huge growth of um, the central city means that a lot of the population growth is there and how do we make sure in s simply in terms of numbers uh, that these people are fairly represented in an equal way um, compared to the rest of Auckland. So that's what it's about, and I'm happy to give you the, the much more nerdy answer to the to the question um, outside. So um, it was, uh, Oscar mentioned that um, nominations are closing at 12 o'clock tomorrow. You still have time to decide to run for council until 12 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, just make sure that you put your nomination on time. And uh, if you're not enrolled to vote, for those of you who haven't voted before, the Electoral Commission is outside and you can enroll tonight. So just do it. Um, and, otherwise, um, have a <laughs> and otherwise, you will continue to um, be able, even if the rolls close, you will continue to be, to be able to enroll and cast a special vote for the local election. So don't think that it's too late. You can get involved until the very last minute. In terms of next steps, the local your your voting papers will start being delivered in your uh, letterboxes from the 20th of September, 
in the last day to vote is 12 o'clock on um, the 8th of October, on the, sorry, the 12th of October, 12 o'clock on Saturday, the 12th of October. So make sure that you return your ballot paper um, on time. You will, you're able to return it through obviously the mail, but we will also have voting boxes in our service centers, in, in our libraries, so make the, make the most use of it. Um, just a reminder that votoclone.co.nz is our website, and as soon as we've got the final list of candidates, which will be tomorrow, Friday, after 5 o'clock, from next week you will have the profiles of candidates online, so you'll be able to learn a little bit more about who is standing. And there's a lot more information about where to vote and how to vote there as well, so um, votoclone.co.nz is the place to go. And um, to finish, I really want to thank you, Oscar, um, for facilitating this session tonight. So very big thank you to you. A big thank you again to our panel for your uh, very thought-provoking uh, comments. And a big thank you again to our sponsors for um, making Auckland Conversations possible. Our next Auckland Conversations will be announced very soon. So please stay tuned and have a look on our website. It will be towards the end of September. It's, uh, we keep it secret like your vote, but we'll tell you all about it very soon. So thank you very much to all of you who were here tonight, and thank you very much to all of you who were watching us online. Wishing you a very good evening.